irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show. Let's talk investing. Let's talk stock markets. Let's talk getting your retirement. You listen. I'll do my best to help you get to retirement. I'll do my best to find one or two things that that make you a better investor today. Zoom down to sixteen percent yesterday. Pandemic ended, and we're starting to talk people face to face more. I'm starting to go to bars and talk. Scheduling fewer Zooms, that's really not it because they're not making a lot of money on the, the regular person, right? It's the uh, businesses have slowed down and people are starting to roll back into work. So it's worth noting there's a period of times where stock stocks within a stock universe and the pandemic stock universe is what I'm talking about here. Zoom is very, very, very much so. Uh, it's seen its easiest days. Dow was down one half percent yesterday. The SP 500 down one quarter of percent. The NASDAQ was ultimately flat for the day. Stocks barely budged on a day when surveys showed concerning drops in business activity in the United States, Europe, and Japan. Zoom has run up against their own 40 minute time limit. It's like the Andy Warhol. It needs to understand that its 15 minutes of fame is, is, is struggled. It's played itself out on some levels. Former security chief of Twitter yesterday said that Twitter has massive security issues. It feels weird that this whole Elon Musk trial. Um, will he or won't he buy Twitter? Has he sold a lot of shares of Tesla so that he can raise money because he might have to? It looks like he's prepared. But it was an explosive whistleblower complaint. Twitter executives deceived federal officials about extensive security issues within the app that leaves personal information vulnerable and can even pose a risk to national security. Personally, doesn't that sound like that former security chief should have fixed this problem or brought the problem up at the time? How how can he be a chief security officer? I don't know, right? What it all means for Musk is... Um, people have been deceptive. Management had so many financial incentives to lie is the implication because they were tied towards stock bonuses for metrics that were considered positive. We'll see where it goes. It, the claim could help Elon Musk in his attempt to pull out of the $44 billion purchase of Twitter. Cruising right now. Um, Yesterday, there was no announcement on student loan debt. I did a story on television on it. It got a big reaction. 62% of Americans think that the United States government should cancel some student debt. It's pretty interesting because it could cause inflation. It may not be what is in the best interest of the Biden administration. You take away someone's $10,000 debt and suddenly they have $10,000 more to spend potentially. I know it seems like I don't think it's a bad thing to take away debt from younger people. I don't think it's good, but I think the implications could be positive. Um, having people start their careers earlier, having people get out of mom and dad's earlier, going from apartment to home. That, there's a lot of economic, economic activity that's assigned to what you can't do when you have debt versus what you can do when you lose that debt. Um, U.S. life expectancy yesterday, we got a new number, it plunged in 2020. It dropped the most since World War II, declining in all 50 states due to COVID and unintentional injuries, such as drug overdoses in the United States. That's sad, isn't it? I get the COVID, but the unintentional injuries category sounds a little, little discouraging. The state where you can live the longest is no surprise to me. It's Hawaii, 80 years, seven months. The state with the least amount of life expectancy, 71 years and uh, 70, almost 72 years, is Mississippi. And for those Californians, my audience is largely Californian. If you've never been to Mississippi, it makes sense when you go. It is a lot of smoking and some really big people. So this is how I learned how to spell Mississippi in, in elementary school. Am I a cooker letter, cooker letter, ah, cooker letter, cooker letter, ah, hunchback letter, hunchback letter, ah. 
I don't know why it worked or why it stuck. I don't know who did that to me, but every time, every time I see the word Mississippi, that's how I spell it. Okay. I know we should move on. Should we not? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> um, talking about today, it's Wednesday. It's hump day. Stock market has quite a hump to get over. The bigger the hump seems to be the mountain of expectations right now built in front of the Fed Chair Powell speech on Friday. We talked about it on Monday. We talked about it on Tuesday. We're talking about it on Wednesday. On Thursday, we're going to talk about the Fed Chairman Powell's speech in Jackson Hole at the Economic Policy Symposium. Expectations range from a fear of, you know, he's going to be resoundingly hawkish to a hope of a tempered rate type outlook. Some housing numbers have come out this week on new home and overall home prices showing a drop. Will that work its way into the Fed speech? Uh, we're seeing things that are leading to a drop of inflation. It's not as much as we want right now, but we're going to get there. Or does he keep saying inflation is unacceptably too high? We're going to fight, 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 fight. Two very different responses from Wall Street could happen on how, how those play out. Home builder, toll brothers. The home builders, are, they're interesting. I don't know any home builders. I've always, it's, it's a, it's something that I want to do. Now, technically, I own some through an S&P 500 fund, right? Toll Brothers top third quarter earnings, but missed on its deliveries. It's telling us exactly what we're seeing in the housing market. The housing market doesn't have its prices shown every single day like Wall Street does. So we're, we have to wait for the monthly data. And... People are getting a little bit chicken with higher mortgage costs. There's still demand, but it's also kind of interesting. It, it brings up one of the very first things that we talked about on this show of one of the very first strategies we can teach each other is which would you rather have? And my children, 11 and 13 years old, say this to me all the time. Which would you rather, dad, uh, play quarterback for five years or play a defensive back for 10? And I'm like, oh, well, I'd rather play defensive back for 10 because you get a better pension. Maybe not as much money as a quarterback. Okay, okay, okay. Um, which would you rather have low interest rates or lower home prices? High interest rates or lower home prices? I would ha rather have the low interest rates. So I feel good even though I overpaid a year ago because I got a 30-year mortgage. There's going to be years where that doesn't really work out in the housing market and we do see home prices drop. I think the low cost of money rock, scissors, paper. Low cost of money over home price. Yes, we are seeing home prices fall. And I'm going to do a segment today on TV that says it could be one month, it could be three years. So if you're looking for prices to fall to be your catalyst, that's my, my thought. That's what history has taught. And that's what I share. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. This segment, I'm going to talk about the metaverse. This segment, I'm going to talk about one of the most important inventions ever for retail. Next segment, we're going to talk with Patrick O'Hare about the stock market and his outlook. He's with briefing.com. I Heart Media is a big, big, big group of radio stations, and they have a lot of power in the music and concert world. You probably know that. I've worked for iHeartMedia back in the day when it was known as a different company. But iHeartMedia plans to host a Metaverse concert in Fortnite. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's Metaverse is silly. It is one of the worst things I've ever seen. Go Google Mark Zuckerberg Metaverse and just look at images or go to YouTube and look at the videos that have been in like the last month. He is catching a lot of flack because he's creating a, a creepy world where eyelashes don't blink and people notice and it's, it's just, it's not going well. And what's the worst part about it is he's putting himself right in the middle of the metaverse as the main character. As if some creepy billionaire with lots of money needs to be a godlike figure in a virtual world, like he's a godlike figure in the social media world. 
Um, he needs to come up with a better avatar system that's not based on his looks. First and foremost, he's a little, as my mother would say, unfortunate looking. But second, it just it's too weird seeing a billionaire try to take on that. You must adorize me. It's like, what? So iHeartMedia is going to, I think, where the real metaverse is right now, Fortnite. And when Fortnite comes public, you can see that it's not just going to be a video game with Epic. They're going to try to get a lot of corporate worlds to move into the, the metaverse. And it won't just be, it'll be Epic's metaverse. It won't be just Fortnite's metaverse. But iHeartMedia has launched the first virtual world in Fortnite called iHeartland as the company extends its marketing investments towards a younger audience iHeart, which brought in $954 million in revenue in the second quarter, announced plans in January to launch its own branded virtual world on platforms like Roblox. Now they're coming to Fortnite as well. iHeartland was created by the game designer Atlas Creative using Fortnite's creative code and includes a main stage, multiple mini games, and an iHeart headquarters. My industry has already seen, radio has already seen a massive shrinkage in the last 10 years, 20 years. 30 years i'd say every five years it's like oh i'll never see that board op again or oh that general manager's retired and now it's a general manager who has three territories and five years from now there'll be a general manager who has five territories so to see i heart trying to create a main stage on roblox and on uh fortnite it, i think it's the right move i can't wait to go figure out uh, what a concert with Charlie Puth looks like on September 9th. They're going to have a real concert. And Ariana Grande and Travis Scott, they've done real kind of concert-like events on Fortnite, virtual reality. I give iHeartRadio a lot of credit on this one. I think it's not even iHeartRadio anymore. It's just iHeart, which is probably the dumbest name ever. But I'm going to say going into the Fortnite metaverse is a good thing. As kids come to the dinner table and dad says, son, what did you do today? He goes, I saw a concert on uh, 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 Epics on, on the game that I play Fortnite, dad. And he's going to talk about it. And maybe dad will say, you want to go see that concert in real? And not just a virtual world? He goes, no, dad, this was free. I don't even know who Charlie Puth is. I think he's probably a good looking, skinny English guy who's probably dated really pretty singers who were good looking and skinny and whiny and question their 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 role models and their figures and, and like i don't even know who charlie booth is okay so that's the metaverse segment and when epic comes public i think they're doing rock scissors paper they're beating they're beating the snot out of facebook facebook's aiming too high whereas fortnite's kind of cooling the the experience three years ago when my kids saw a marshmallow concert on fortnite they were excited they didn't know who he was they didn't know what a DJ was. They didn't know you could put a fake marshmallow on your head and, and not be known, but spin records well and, and get people dancing up, 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 put your hands in the air, put your hands in the air. Like, I can't even imagine. So anyway, that's one segment that I wanted to hit this segment. Another one that I, I want to hit, okay, I don't know if I go in there. I don't know if I have time at this point. Um, fall boosters are coming out. We know that. Um, and I think we really want to avoid talk on the air about COVID, except for when it's starting to peak in areas and we start seeing shutdowns. I, I think that's probably fair enough for me to say just that kind of simple. To get your calls on the air, it's 800-516-1220. To get your calls on the air, it's 800-516-1220. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Home prices are starting to get hit. Uh, stock prices have already hit this winter. Natural gas prices are going to be high, so people are probably going to be chillier. Maybe that means invest in sweaters. You see how Wall Street always kind of tinkers with these kind of formulas. It's never very simple. Um, NVIDIA is going to report earnings, and it's something that we should really be paying attention to. Uh, because it's been a poster child of what's wrong with the stock market. Super high valuations on companies that have been on a big run for 10 years. Supply chain problems in China. Sometimes due to COVID lockdowns, sometimes due to energy. China's having an energy crunch right now because they don't have enough water to power their hydroelectric dams. 
And if they don't have power, we don't get semiconductors. If they don't have power, we don't get uh, iPhones this fall. And in early September, Apple's going to have another, uh, you know, it's the best thing ever. The question is, will they say, wait, one more thing. At the end of their next presentation, introducing new iPhones, iMacs, AirPods, Beats, will they say, wait, and there's one more thing, and will it be virtual reality headset? Because you don't want to wait too long for Epic to establish the, the ground head in the metaverse and for iHeart to get established with partners in Roblox and Apple wants to be there. We'll see how it's going to play out. But NVIDIA is going to be a big earnings piece. Friday, we're going to get the uh, symposium from Jackson Hole. You know who I would listen to if you get a chance? It's Bloomberg. If you've never listened to Bloomberg Radio or Bloomberg Television, um, you can find a stream of it online. It's amazing content. And they cover Jackson Hole way better than CNBC does. Again, figure out your sources. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Find me online at robblackshow.com. Resources to help you manage your money. Visit robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Coming up later in this hour, I'm going to talk with Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com about market dynamics, what he's seeing with his page one column that he uses from briefing.com. I think it's important to get other people's perspective. I'm not a huge fan of watching CNBC other than, and I say this, um, how do I say this? Tongue in cheek. Yeah, to me, CNBC is, is one inch deep and a mile wide. It's financial porn. It's, it's third grade math. It is not highbrow analysis. If you want better analysis, go to Bloomberg Radio or Bloomberg Television. Um, I'm doing a daily podcast of how the markets act. I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to drop the daily and do a best of on Fridays on the podcast. That's going to be focused heavily on market strategies and interviews with experts. That should start soon. Um, so if you don't have the podcast, you should check it out at Apple iTunes or Google store under the apps and uh, Spotify. You can find it anywhere. Rob Black show. Rob Black Show, formerly known as Rob Black and Your Money. Still all kind of the same thing, right? Um, some of the top stories today is we're waiting for Friday. This is important. Uh, as investors wait, the talking heads on the political shows, the financial shows, kind of make their sausage. What will the Fed do? What will he not say? How crazy will it be? What will happen to the market? See 75 basis points or 100 basis points more. What if they say, he says 50 and we're done? And he wouldn't say 50 and we're done. He'd say, well, here's another 50 basis point we're planning for September. And then we're going to pause and reflect on the data. And then you and I get to see the data. Like this month, we saw financial data come out on home prices. And we're starting to see a crack in new homes and existing home prices on what they sell for. Um, that's anti-inflation. That's a break that the Fed wanted to see. Uh, they're not, they, they have two mandates to keep inflation under control. Their target rate is between 2 and 4%. <clears throat> They'll ideally tell you it's 2%. But sometimes there's going to be points where it heats up and right around 4% it heats up too much. So when we're at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% inflation, it, that's ex exponentially bad. A little bit of inflation is okay. It's very Goldilocksian. Too much shuts down economies or affordability. <clears throat> Too little. And uh, you can stagnate your growth. So stocks are rising today for the first time in three days. While the NASDAQ's kind of been a push, I'm going to say stocks because I'm including the Dow and the S&P 500. The three-day Jackson Hole Economic Symposium starts Thursday. It is a hilarious place to visit. It is a hilarious symposium to go to. Um, incredibly beautiful. They've got bars we can sit at the bar, but you're not sitting in a bar stool. They replaced the stool with a saddle. And let me just tell you, when you find yourself in Jackson Hole talking to an economist during an economic summit, you're like, this is kind of like the Super Bowl for financial nerds. Now, the stock market's made up of winners and losers, not just the indexes that we talk about. Intuit was the best performing stock of the S&P 500, up 5.6% year over year. 
with a strong earnings report. Intuit is one of those tech companies that has been around for 30 years. You know it, I know it. We've used their products before on Texas. Um, they're a really big company and they do a great job. <clears throat> for some reason, I've never owned the company. Uh, same thing with Adobe. There's some tech companies that have, I've always wanted to look at. I look at them and then I've always wanted to buy them and then I go, eh, I'm going to find something else. Good news, bad news. Fall rollout of COVID-19 boosters looks set to start in early September. So you've got about two weeks before you start hearing, come into CVS and get your booster shot. While you're at it, pick up a 10-pack of vitamins. You know, there's little commercials that radio stations play. Come into CVS. Oh, I think we're all going to have post-traumatic stress when we hear about COVID, the new fall rollout boosters. Which again, hanging out with other people last night, um, we all seem to the talk around the table is, you know, Fauci's leaving, but what's his legacy going to be? It's going to be something like uh, we're probably going to be taking COVID boosters for a couple of years, if not forever, or we're going to roll take it for a couple of years and we're going to roll it into the annual flu shot. And people who want the flu shot, we're going to get the flu shot. People who don't want the flu shot won't. And when COVID numbers spike, we'll probably see things shut down again. We're kind of okay with all the understanding there. Peloton did something interesting. They struck a deal to sell their fitness equipment and apparel on Amazon. Previously, they had only sold through their website and physical showrooms. They're also trying to save money by instead of manufacturing it and putting it together for you, they're going to manufacture it and send it to your home. Kind of like you get a couch and you get a, a truck in front of your home and you get two big strong men who carry the couch in and take the old couch out. I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking Peloton sounds, you know, a little more attractive for me. Um, maybe I just need a good step machine or something. I don't know. Still not in the home. I'm still not going back to the gym and it's, it's taking its toll on my muscles. So I'm going to do something at the home sooner than later, because in the last year I did buy a home that could accommodate a space for a mini gym at home. Home prices fell for the first time in three years. That's not good news or is it good news? It depends on if you're a buyer or seller or if you're a realtor. Home prices declined three quarters of 1% from June to July. That's the first monthly decline in three years. It feels small and on a year over year basis, home prices are up 14%. But on a month to month down three quarters of 1% is, it's dramatic. I know you're saying three quarters of 1%. How dramatic can you make it? Dun, dun, dun. Well, it's the second worst July performance dating back to 1991. When we had a decline in July 2010 during the Great Recession. July 2010, Great Recession. Second worst performance dating back to 1991. So let's pull out the abacus and do 10-year chunks. Move one, 91 to 2001. That's 10. 2001 to 2011, that's 20. 2011 to 2021, that's 30 years. This is a big monthly decline. Dun, dun, dun. Um, now, here's some markets that saw massive declines in the last couple of months. San Jose, home prices are down 10%. Seattle, 7.7%. San Francisco, 7.4%. San Diego, 5.6%. Los Angeles, California, down 4.3%. Denver down 4.2%. Now, what's happened in the last couple of months? Interest rates have gone from 3% levels on a 50, uh, 30 year fixed to 4%, 5%, 5.5%, 5 back to 5%. It's playing with that area right now. The higher the interest rate, the less affordable a home is. Sellers are antsy, so they're now starting to cut prices. They're now starting to let you do inspections. The, the higher quality homes are going faster. Inventory is starting to build. This is not the beginning of the end. It's one month. And to me, housing recessions tend to last one month to 36 months. I would to be honest with you, I don't consider it a recession until we probably get two, three, four, five, six months of seeing prices drop. And then it's somewhere between six months and 36 months. That's what 2006, 2008, my head is a history. Am I panicked that I bought a home last year? No. Am I excited that I'm going to get instant gratification this year? No. 
the cracks are starting to show in the stock market with the bear market and now a housing market showing its first cracks in a very long time, but big numbers as well. I'm Rob Black. Find us at robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing and more. It's not lost on me that this week the stock market is waiting to see what some people say out loud. And they're speculating it nonstop on CNBC and Bloomberg television. The Jackson Hole Symposium looms large. Jerome Powell's going to deliver speech on Friday. And a lot of people talk about what other people are going to do. So why, why don't I join that party, so to speak, bring in Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com to talk about what other people are going to do. Mr. O'Hare, what's Mr. Jerome Powell going to do this week and why do we care? Well, good morning, Rob. Morning. Uh, well, Jerome Powell is, is uh, certainly going to have to acknowledge that inflation uh, remains a problem for the U.S. economy uh, and will undoubtedly uh, offer an indication that the Fed is is going to continue to raise interest rates uh, until it's convinced that uh, the inflation rate is coming, you know, back down considerably closer to its uh, 2% target. Um, the question I think here on, on the market's mind is whether uh, the, the chair is going to uh, provide any type of opening to suggest that maybe the Fed will at least temper the pace of its rate hikes in coming months to allow for the, uh, to you know, to assess how the impact of prior rate hikes are affecting the economy. Uh, and then the, on the other side of it, though, you have hawks who think that he might just come flat out and say that, you know, we're not at that point yet. We're going to continue to be aggressive to really stamp out inflation. You write every day for briefing.com and Oftentimes we are, it's, it's, I find it's not lost in me that it's, it's odd that we're talking about what is another man going to say on Friday, but he is really a key central figure in this movie or this, this production, this show of our economy. And uh, it's just funny because do you remember when we were talking about what, what briefcase Greenspan brought to the Fed Reserve meetings? Like he was going to raise interest rates based on the briefcase or what time he left. It's um, we can be a humorous lot. Can we not in the financial media? For sure, for sure. And in this case, I'm always I'm struck now by any time uh, the FOMC, you know, meets and makes a decision, you know, it's always the biggest decision ever for the FOMC or any time Fed Chair Powell gives a speech. It's, it's the most important speech of his career. Right. So we keep we keep ratcheting up uh, the importance of every uh, aspect of what the Fed does. Um, I, you know, I get why that 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 is the case uh, because there's such a central figure in terms of the functioning of financial markets and, and how their uh, monetary policy dictates uh, certainly the stock market and treasury markets reactions. And, um, but it is a bit amusing to me in that respect that, you know, um, everything is always the most important uh, thing we've ever heard. Um, And we need to, you know, it'll be a good day when we kind of like get back to, a period where that is not the case and it's just a fed meeting and it's right. just the fed chair giving a speech i've got some friends who are from europe and when they come to visit the united states they're always surprised by how much coverage we do of the nfl they're like back in the back in england we don't talk about manchester united one tenth this much as you talk about the nfl in between games uh, we just like to speculate we like to to talk we like to create stories but there has to be more it's patrick o'hare with briefing.com in your page one column uh you really covered the earning season pretty well how do you feel we are or how do you feel where we are coming out of earning season and where we're going well i think you know coming out of this earning season there's a pretty much a prevailing view that things were, were better than feared um okay. now that's not to say that they they were good necessarily we still did have positive eps growth for the s p 500 uh of around the close of just over six percent i think um you know that was driven predominantly well frankly entirely by the energy sector which contributed about 10 percentage points to that growth rate so you take out energy and you actually have um you know negative eps growth in the second quarter and and i think that that's somewhat indicative of, of, of where we are going um you know there's a lot of writing on the wall that suggests to us that uh, the economic you know environment is going to be more challenging now in coming months and with that we should see uh, more difficulties in terms of 
achieving stronger earnings growth. And so we expect those uh, earnings estimates to continue to track lower. Okay. Uh, likely to hear more more warnings in coming coming weeks and months. Uh, and uh, you know we have to be on the lookout really for I think a profit recession uh, moving into 2023. Um, the timing is always, we want it to move a little bit faster than it actually does, but I think you make a good point. Um, there was a Bank of America, Merrill Lynch survey not that long ago that said, we've had 15 of the greatest low interest rate years ever in for the stock market, great environment. And they said, be prepared for 15 years of higher interest rates. Are you looking at it that kind of midterm? Because I know we focus a lot on the short term. Are we now in a new transition or a new market where we're more moderately priced, higher priced interest rates will affect the economy for a longer period of time? Well, you know, relative to where they were, they're higher, but, you know, we're still below what kind of okay. average used to be. <laughs> so uh, it is a different environment uh, and we should uh, uh, really, you know, be thinking that interest rates are moving more toward a normalization uh, range, um, but we certainly have a lot more debt outstanding. We're still running, you know, large fiscal deficits, um, you know, so, uh, and you have a Fed that is, you know, sitting on an $8 trillion plus balance sheet that it's, you know, stated that it wants to, you know, whittle down to a more reasonable level. And so, um, so there's certainly, uh, a good enough underlying basis to think that the interest rate environment is going to be higher and, and different than what we've seen over the last 15 years. And and frankly, I think that should be something we should really kind of want because, you know, the last 15 years have been, well, challenging in a lot of respects and not necessarily, uh, you know, in, in a good way between the housing crisis and the, you know, the COVID pandemic and, you know, the embrace of quantitative easing and, and, and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, moving to a normal period, normal area is, is, is progress, but it is something we'll have to get our minds around and adjust to. And that's why I think we're seeing certainly in the housing sector right now, you know, it's a difficult adjustment because, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, attractive financing rates for an extended period here that's made home ownership more affordable but now with the rapid adjustment in, in mortgage rates uh, that's not the case anymore and so we're just going to have to settle in here and realize that you know mortgage rates probably are going to stay stickier at higher levels for, for an extended period and by saying mortgage rate or not interest rates are going to stay stickier you're probably implying that inflation is going to be a little bit higher than we want for a more longer period of time so it's it's a lot to really process into your portfolios and into your mindset as you approach retirement what else are you working on mr o'hare at briefing.com that we could look forward to in your upcoming structures of writing including the big picture on fridays right well well i think importantly what we did work on more recently was an updated market view um, which effectively just made the case uh, that, you know, the, while we had a really nice move off those mid-June lows, uh, the, it didn't have a whole lot of fundamental support behind it. Um, and there's a lot of fundamental support factors, you know, that are still lacking. And, and you know, that in particular being, you know, the fact that, you know, earnings estimates are, are we think, still too high. Uh, the stock market needs the Fed to be on its side, really, and, and the Fed is not there yet. You know, inflation is still far too high. It needs to come down a lot more. Uh, we need more energy price relief. And, you know, it's nice to see what we've seen recently at the gas pumps, but it's not enough. And especially when you look at what's going on with natural gas prices and, and uh, what we heard even out of Bloomberg this morning in terms of the difficulties a lot of U.S. households are having in paying their utility bills. So we've got a lot of issues out there that uh, need to need improvement to, to see a sustained breakout here in the, in the S&P 500. Um, but, um, you know, so that's one thing I'm working on. And then uh, in all likelihood, you know, I'll, I'll feel obligated and, and to have to write something about what Fed Chair Powell says on Friday. Uh, that is certainly the, the topic of the week. And, you know, we like to keep our, our subscribers certainly uh uh, up to date and in touch with the main market moving points. And uh, there's no way we, we can do that without uh, talking about what the Fed chair says this Friday. 
Thank you very much for being with us. That's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news. I've been using the service for 20 plus years. I really enjoy Patrick O'Hare and I think he brings a nice perspective, a very understandable perspective to the markets and what's happening and why. Um, We're not always right, but we always have thoughts on it. Thanks very much, Mr. O'Hare. Moving on, some other thoughts to think about as we go into break. It is really all about Friday. With the tone in the market. But that doesn't mean we can't find some things to to look at and and pick at um, while we're getting there. The housing market is not very liquid. It takes time to buy and sell a home. You can't say I'm in. It's, It's gotten a lot faster. But it's not as liquid. So we look at the data on month to month basis. So we're looking for more trends. Home prices declined seven tenths of 1% from June, July, the first month of decline in nearly three years. While the drop may seem small, it's the largest single monthly decline in prices since January 2011. It's the second worst July since 1991. Again, July, hot home selling time as parents want to get settled in before the school season starts back up. The sharp and fast rise in mortgage rates really seem to cause the most headway for the pricey housing market. But home affordability is starting to get a little bit of a crack in it. It's a good thing, not a bad thing if you don't own a home. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial.